Richard Speck was born on December 6th, 1941, to Benjamin Speck and Mary Carbaugh. He was their seventh child, and shortly after his birth, the family moved to a larger home in Monmouth, Illinois. When he was just six years old, Richard's father dropped dead of a heart attack. Richard was devastated. He was particularly close to his father, preferring to spend time with him over his seven siblings. Three years later, his mother married a man who couldn't have been any more different than Benjamin Speck. Carl Lindbergh was a borderline alcoholic with a rap sheet going back almost 25 years. Benjamin Speck had been a lifelong teetotaler who never had any run-ins with the law. Following his mother's marriage, Richard stayed with his aunt for a few months so that he could complete the second grade before joining his mother and new stepfather in Santo, Texas. If Richard thought that he was going to have the same relationship with Carl Lindbergh as he had enjoyed with his biological father, then he was in for a rude awakening. Lindbergh was an out-and-out -out bully. Drunk most of the time, he would belittle and mock his new stepchildren. For some reason, Richard bore the brunt of Lindbergh's abuse. Life was tough for the young Richard, but it only got worse in 1952 when his 23-year-old brother was killed in a car accident. Throughout middle school and high school, Richard was a loner. He didn't attempt to make friends, preferring his own company. When he was mocked and teased by his classmates for wearing glasses, Richard stopped wearing them, even though it meant that he could not read a word in any of his textbooks. He ended up having to repeat the 8th grade, and it was around this time that he first started drinking alcohol. By the time he was 15 years old, he was drinking almost every day. He also began carrying out burglaries and thefts, notching up dozens of arrests all before his 16th birthday. In 1958, he was called out of class for a chat with Crozier Technical High School's principal. When asked whether he had any intention of making something of himself in life, Richard shrugged his shoulders. The principal informed him that there was no point in him continuing with his education if that was the case and told him to vacate the school's premises and never return. After securing a low paying job at a bottling plant, Richard met a 15 year old girl at the Texas State Fair. Shirley Malone fell pregnant just three weeks after meeting Richard and he was expected to do the honourable thing and marry her. The two were still practically strangers to one another when they walked down the aisle in January of 1962. Richard didn't have enough money for a down payment on a house, so he and Shirley moved in with Carolyn Speck and her husband. They were joined shortly thereafter by Richard's mother, who had finally seen sense and divorced Carl Lindbergh. After tying the knot to Shirley, Richard had stopped using Lindbergh's name and was once more using his biological father's surname. Richard was in jail for being involved in a drunken brawl when his daughter, Robbie Lynn Speck, came into the world on July 5th, 1962. Marriage did nothing to curb Richard's criminal inclinations. At the age of 21, he was sentenced to three years behind bars after forging and cashing a colleague's $43 paycheck. He served 16 months of his sentence before being released from the Texas State Penitentiary on parole. His freedom would only last a week though. On January 9th, 1965, 23-year-old Speck was loitering in the dark parking lot of an apartment building in Dallas just after 2 a.m. He'd been drinking and was carrying a long knife with him. He was looking for a fight or something worse. Speck spotted a young woman across the lot. She parked her car and headed towards the apartment building. Speck watched her from the darkness and readied the knife. As she walked past, he pounced. The woman screamed as Speck tackled her and held the knife to her throat. He told her not to scream, but she was too terrified to do anything but, and those screams got the attention of a neighbor. As the neighbor approached, Speck fled into the surrounding alleyways, trying to slip away into the darkness. Police cars were on the scene within minutes and began combing the area. Speck tossed the knife into the bushes and tried to walk naturally, but the cops had already spotted him. Before Speck had a chance to run for it, the police cornered him in an alley and arrested him. At first, Speck claimed complete innocence, but the woman had clearly described him to the police. 
So he said he was in a drunken haze and couldn't remember the attack. None of the excuses worked and Spack was found guilty of assault and parole violation. He was sentenced to 490 days in prison but served less than half that time. Somehow Spack had slipped through the cracks again. After his release Spack felt emboldened. He'd seemingly beaten multiple felony charges over the previous years. In fact Spack wore his criminal past as a badge of honour, proof of his rebellion against the world and so his violent behaviour only escalated. His wife however had had enough of Richard Spack and left him by the end of 1965. Spack wasn't surprised by the failure of his marriage. It was just another example of the world rejecting him even if he caused it. In the immediate aftermath of his divorce Spack went out looking for trouble. Needing to release his internalised anger, he instigated an argument with another drinker at a bar, which quickly escalated into a full on fight. It ended when Spack pulled out a switchblade and stabbed his rival. Spack knew he'd crossed a line. With no one else left in his life, he turned to his mother for help. She hired a lawyer who successfully framed the stabbing in the context of a good old fashioned bar fight. The assault charge was reduced to disturbing the peace. Spack was fined $10. His brush with a potentially serious felony didn't scare him straight. It only emboldened him to continue pushing his luck. Two months later, he stole 70 cartons of cigarettes from a grocery store and tried to sell them in a nearby parking lot. Spack managed to get rid of the cigarettes and flee before the police arrived, but an arrest warrant was issued. Spack worried that the cops and courts might have a personal grudge against him after failing to imprison him for the stabbing. If they caught him, they would throw the book at him, so Spack decided to run. On March 9th, 1966, as the police searched for him, Spack boarded a bus headed north. He wanted to go back to the beginning, back to the last place he felt happy and accepted, his hometown in Illinois. But Spack was no longer a quiet lonely child. He was now a one man storm of aggression and crime and when he returned home, violence inevitably followed. His fresh start in Monmouth quickly soared. He got a job as a carpenter but lost it when he made a habit of skipping work to spend time at the bar. Speck tried to reconnect with his older sisters who still lived in Monmouth but none of them wanted much to do with their troublesome younger brother, the black sheep of their family. So Speck found himself living the same life he had back in Dallas, floating between odd jobs, drinking heavily and committing acts of violence. He also picked up a reputation as a braggart and a liar. In bar conversations he claimed that he left Dallas because he killed a man and spent time smuggling drugs into the country from Mexico. Speck was quickly known in Monmouth as a seedy, dangerous character and as the months went on he lived up to that reputation. Just after midnight on April 2nd 1966 Speck broke into the home of Virgil Horace, a 65 year old woman. While rifling through the empty house, Spack heard Horace return home. He rushed to the front door and grabbed the woman. He pushed a knife to her throat and threatened to kill her if she screamed. Horace complied and tried to reason with Spack, but he wasn't receptive. Spack pulled Horace into the bedroom and ordered her to remove her clothes before sexually assaulting her. Then he tied her up and fled. Horace managed to free herself and get to a hospital where she reported the crime and described her assailant as a polite man with a southern drawl. A week later Spack struck again. Mary Catherine Pierce, a 32 year old barmaid, was found behind the tavern where she worked. She'd been killed by a single blow to her abdomen by a blunt object which ruptured her liver. Within two days the police focused their investigation on Richard Spack who frequented the bar where Pierce worked and according to Pierce's friends had an interest in her. When they discovered he was from Texas, the investigators realised that Spack was probably the perpetrator of the Horace assault as well. The police summoned Spack to the police station where they questioned him about both crimes 
but their interrogations ended abruptly. When Spack complained that he was feeling sick, he asked to reschedule their questioning for a different day, and the police obliged. As soon as he left the police station, he skipped town. It remains unclear to this day if Spack was actually responsible for the murder of Mary Catherine Pierce, or if he simply didn't want to take any chances with the Monmouth police. Either way, Spack wanted out of the small town, and so he ran. He showed up unannounced at the Chicago home of his older sister, Martha. Spack had a story for Martha and her husband, claiming he had to escape Monmouth because a gang of drug dealers was out to get him. Martha was automatically sceptical of everything Spack said. Martha had already grown up by the time her mother remarried and moved the family to Texas, so she didn't really know her brother very well. And like her other siblings, she viewed Spack as the black sheep of the family, the product of an alcoholic and violent stepfather they all disliked. Still, out of a sense of family obligation, Martha tried to help her wayward brother. She and her husband successfully secured Spack a job as a deckhand on a steel freighter travelling the Great Lakes. Martha hoped that the isolation and discipline of working on a boat might straighten him out. It didn't. His drinking and violence continued. And after barely two months aboard the freighter, Spack was fired for fighting. Spack's sister and brother-in-law were reaching the end of their rope. They again tried to get Spack a steady job, bringing him to the National Maritime Union to pick up deckhand work. But Spack failed to get his life together because he had no interest in living a normal life. He just wanted to drink and fight. He could no longer stay at his sister's house, so he got a room at a nearby boarding house and waited for work. On July 12th, Speck received an assignment on an oil tanker. He packed his things and drove to the dock, only to find that the job was already taken. With no other choice, he returned to the union hall. Without enough money to pay for a room, Spack spent the night on a park bench outside the hall. The next day, he sat outside for hours, waiting for another deckhand position to open up. But as the day wore on, no jobs came and his mood turned sour. He was furious at the MNU for giving away a job they had assigned to him and at his family for abandoning him. He blamed the world for his poverty and modern life. He felt trapped by his failures and his dwindling options. By late morning, with temperatures approaching 100 degrees, Spack's frustration finally boiled over. He gave up on getting a deckhand job and opted for another path. He convinced his brother-in-law to loan him $25 for a room at the inn, then immediately went to a nearby tavern to begin drinking. As he knocked back drink after drink, Spack brooded on the rage and dejection that were beginning to overwhelm him. And there was only one way Spack knew how to express those emotions, with violence. Later that night, Spack was walking between bars when he spotted 53-year-old Ella Mae Hooper. Spack made a few awkward advances towards Hooper, who tried to keep her distance from this strange man, 30 years her junior. Spack was furious at the rejection. He caught up to Hooper and pressed a knife against her back. He told her they were going to have a drink together. If she refused, he'd stab her. Hooper froze in fear and complied. He told her that he wasn't going to hurt her or rob her. He just wanted to talk. He led the shaking, panicking Hooper back to his room at the inn, where he sat her down on the bed and offered her a beer. Then Spack asked her a series of bizarre questions. Did she have children? Did she like younger men? Would she sleep with him willingly? Spack wasn't just looking for a victim to assault. In his own violent and strange way, he was looking for someone to simply accept him, while the rest of the world rejected him. Hooper tried to be what Spack wanted, to avoid angering him. She even said she would sleep with him, but Spack didn't believe her. So, he ordered her into bed and raped her. Afterwards, he rifled through her purse and found a 22 caliber gun, which he took for himself. Spack, now armed with a knife and a gun, 
walked Hooper downstairs back out to the street. Speck told her to meet him later that night at the bar and threatened to kill her and her family if she stood him up or told anyone about what happened. It was just past 8 o'clock and Speck still wasn't satisfied with the damage he'd already done. The night was still young and he had more he wanted to do. He returned to the tavern where he continued drinking. He nearly instigated another fight by pulling out the gun, but cooler heads prevailed. Speck needed to do something else to satisfy his violent appetite. Around 10pm, Speck left the tavern and returned to his room. After a day of drinking heavily, Speck had worked up enough liquid courage to do what he'd always wanted to do. Get revenge on the world and get revenge on the people who hated him. He collected his hunting knife and changed into an all black outfit. Then he left the room and walked in the direction of the NMU Herring Hall. The weather had cooled down by 11pm as Richard Speck approached the hall, a mile and a half away from the tavern. But Speck had another destination in mind, a row of townhouses across the street. Speck knew that many of the residents were nursing students from the South Chicago Community Hospital. Speck crept into the alleyway that ran behind the townhouses and approached his target, 2319 E100 Street. Unlike the other townhouses, the lights inside were off. The nurses inside were already asleep. Speck used his pocket knife to pry open a window in the townhouse, reach inside and unlock the back door. Breathing heavily with anticipation, Speck stepped into the dark and quiet house, knife and gun at the ready, prepared to kill. As Speck stepped deeper into the dark townhouse, the women who lived inside, all nursing students, had already retired to their upstairs bedrooms. So Speck ascended the stairs and walked up to the first bedroom door. Inside the room were two Filipino exchange students in their early 20s. Corazon Amuro and Merlita Gargulo. Amuro was asleep in her bed while Gargulo recited her nightly prayers when they heard four quiet knocks on their door. Amuro didn't think anything was odd about the knock so she opened the door. She was shocked to find a shadowy man standing on the other side dressed all in black. The man raised his hand refilling a gun and stepped inside the bedroom. Amuro turned away from Speck, terrified. Speck took another step towards her and demanded to know where the other housemates were. But neither nurse said anything as they were too scared to speak. Speck grabbed Amuro's arm and asked the question again. But she couldn't bring herself to say a word as tears trickled down her face. Frustrated, Speck ordered the nurses to walk out of their bedroom. They fearfully complied. Speck pushed the gun into Amiro's back as he walked her and Gurgulo to the large bedroom at the end of the hallway. Inside the dark bedroom, Speck turned on the light to see three other nurses sleeping in the room. As they began to groggily wake up, he stared down at them, momentarily lost in his own dark thoughts. While Speck was briefly distracted, Amiro and Gurgulo took their chance. Amiro grabbed one of the waking nurses and bolted into the bedroom's closet, slamming the door shut behind them. An angered Speck tried to pull the closet door open, but the three desperate nurses managed to hold it closed. For the moment, they were safe. Seething, Speck held his gun at the other two nurses' heads and instructed them to get their housemates to come out of the closet. Speck promised that he wouldn't hurt anyone. They calmly did what he asked, telling their colleagues in the closet that it was safe to come out. They took the other women at their word. They stepped out of the closet and back into the clutches of Richard Speck. Motioning with his gun, he made the nurses sit on the ground in front of him. He tried to speak softly and calmly. Speck claimed that he was only there for money, enough to supposedly get him to New Orleans. The nurses offered Speck what little cash they had in their purses. Speck watched as the nurses gathered their money and then froze as he heard footsteps coming up the stairs. 
another student nurse, Gloria Davy, had returned from a date with her fiancé. When she approached the master bedroom door, Spack burst out of the room and grabbed her. He threw Gloria onto the floor with the rest of the hostages and slid his knife out of his pocket. The nurses sat quietly as Spack sliced up their bed sheets into strips which he used to tie his hostages up with knots he had learned as a sailor. Once they were all bound, Spack chose his first victim, Pamela Wilkening. He pulled her off the floor and marched her down the hallway and into an empty bedroom. Using the bed sheets, Spack tied Wilkening to the floor and prepared to rape her when he suddenly heard the front door open. Two more nursing students, Mary Ann Jordan and Susan Forrest, were happily chatting as they walked up the stairs, completely unaware of what was happening. They walked down the upstairs hallway to the master's bedroom, where they were suddenly greeted by the horrifying sight of their housemates tied up. Just then, Richard Spack emerged from one of the bedrooms, knife and gun held high. Jordan and Forrest screamed and turned to run, but Spack chased them down and blocked the exit. Shoving the gun in their faces, Spack ordered them into the room with Pamela Wilkinney. Once inside, Spack's violent desires burst out fully. He killed Suzanne Forrest and Mary Ann Jordan, stabbing and strangling them both. Then he turned his attention back to Pamela Wilkinney, but he abandoned his initial plan. Instead of raping her, he stabbed her to death. Sexual murders tend to fall into one of two criminal profiles. The sadistic profile and the anger profile. Sadistic murderers are driven by a desire to dominate and control and their crimes are often carefully premeditated. Anger driven sexual murderers like Richard Spax are more often driven by personal problems like loneliness, family difficulties unemployment failures. They want to lash out at the world for perceived societal rejection and are often fueled by drugs and alcohol. Spack might not have had any intention of killing when he entered the townhouse that evening but he wanted to put himself in a dangerous situation where his anger could take over. But taking three lives didn't save his anger. It fueled it. It fueled it. He wanted more. Spack stumbled back into the master bedroom to select his next victim. In his focus on killing, he didn't notice that one of his hostages, Corazon Amiro, had rolled herself underneath one of the beds and out of view. Spack then selected Nina Jo Schmall. He untied her and led her out of the room at gunpoint and into another empty bedroom where he repeated what he did to Pamela Wilkinney. Over the next three hours, Spack took each nurse one by one out of the master bedroom and killed them. Corazon Amiro lay silently under the bed, watching as her friends and roommates were dragged out of the room. She was helpless to fight back and too afraid to run. At 3.30 a.m. the master bedroom was seemingly empty. Spack never noticed Amiro hiding under the bed. She listened as he went through the remaining clothing and purses, stealing every last cent he could. Then she heard him walk back down the stairs and leave the townhouse. Spack walked home, having had his fill of violence for the evening. He'd finally taken out his anger on the world. He tossed his bloodied knife into the river and returned to his room at the inn. Just before dawn, he laid his head on the pillow and peacefully drifted off to sleep. Back in the nurse's townhouse, Corazon Amiro was shaking and silently crying underneath the bed, still wedged in her hiding spot. As the sun rose at 5.30, Amiro finally worked up the courage to undo her bindings and pull herself out from the bed. She left the bedroom and saw the carnage that Spack left. The bodies of her fellow nurses were left in the other bedrooms. Horrified and in shock, Corazon opened a second floor window with shaky hands and crawled out onto the ledge. Then she began to scream in both English and her native Tagalog for anyone to hear. They're all dead. 
My friends are all dead. The police arrived soon after. Reporters from the Chicago Tribune and then other papers were close behind. This wasn't just front page news. This was the crime of the century. Fortunately for the police, Corazon Amuro gave them a good description of the killer. Six feet tall, short blonde hair and unusual for Chicago, a southern drawl. Within a few hours, investigators had asked around town and discovered that several people had seen or spoken to a man that fit that exact description, Richard Spack. By the time the investigators had discovered his name, Spack had started his day. He woke up and went down to the tavern to order his first drink, seemingly without a cur in the world. As Spack happily drank his way into the afternoon, the police tried to make their move. They had an NMU agent called Spack and asked him to report to the Union Hall for a job opening on a ship, but Spack somehow knew it was a setup, and instead of walking into a trap, he hopped into a cab and headed to the north side of Chicago. Having put some distance between himself and the police, Spack wandered into yet another bar and continued drinking. Meanwhile, the investigators pressed on. Using fingerprints and FBI records, the police placed Spack inside the townhouse. When shown a photo, Corazon Amiro confirmed that Spack was their man. Within three days of the murders, Spack saw his own name and face printed across the front page of the Chicago Tribune. The updated description of a suspect included an account of Spack's tattoos, including the words, born to raise hell, etched on his left forearm. The police were closing in and it wouldn't be long before they found him. Spack checked into a low rent hotel in Skid Row, where the rooms resembled jail cells, and tried to plan his next move. He had nowhere to go, no money and no options. Spack could only see one way out. So, on the night of Saturday, July 16th, Spack cut his wrists open with a broken wine bottle. Neighbouring hotel guests found Spack covered in his own blood and called the police. Spack was rushed to the hospital, where doctors worked to save his life. As one of the doctors worked on Spack's injured arm, he noticed a tattoo with the words, born to raise hell. He recognized it from the newspaper. The doctor asked his patient what his name was. The patient, still in shock, drunk and delirious, replied that his name was Richard Spack. The police placed Spack in leg shackles, even before the doctors finished saving his life. When he had recovered, Spack was booked and sent to the Cook County Jail where he was evaluated by a panel of psychologists. They had determined he was fit to stand trial. Spack's highly publicised trial began on April 3rd, 1967. The press and general public were fascinated and disturbed by the crime and the seemingly inhuman sociopathic killer. Throughout his trial, Spack remained emotionless and cold. Even when Corazon Amiro took the stand and dramatically declared without a doubt that he was the killer. Spack claimed he blacked out due to the alcohol and drugs that were in his system. Even if he did commit the crime, his attorneys argued he wasn't responsible for his actions. But the argument didn't hold water in court. After a two week trial and just 49 minutes of jury deliberations, Richard Spack was found guilty. The jury recommended the death penalty. Richard Spack spent six years on death row. In 1972, the United States Supreme Court declared the death penalty illegal and Spack was resentenced to serve eight consecutive sentences of 50 to 150 years. In 1978, after more than a decade behind bars, 36-year-old Richard Spack gave his first interview. He admitted to killing the nurses and claimed he felt sorry for what he did, but still couldn't explain why he had done it. He seemed to blame his behaviour on his abuse of childhood, saying, Parents out to be careful with their kids. I don't know why it happened to me, but any kid can end up just like me. Ten years later, 40-year-old Spack was asked again why he'd killed the nurses. He responded, It just wasn't their night. The real motivation behind Spack's killings remains a mystery to this day. At the time, authorities, including the Board of Psychologists, consulted at his trial, deemed Spack a sociopath 
who killed for his own gratification. Spack's murders made a lasting mark on American culture. In his obituaries, journalists noted that Spack was the first person in American history called a mass murderer, sparking an era of mass violence. In the interview he gave in 1978, Spack was asked if he had any final thoughts for the American people. He responded, Just tell them to keep up their hatred for me. I know it keeps up their morale, and I don't know what I would do without it. Richard Spack spent his entire life believing the world hated him, and it was punishing him with tragedy, abuse, and isolation. As a teenager and adult, he lashed out, returning that perceived hate with violence. Finally, after committing one of the bloodiest crimes in American history, Speck felt vindicated. The world finally, truly hated him as much as he always thought it did.